So we're going over some of the quotes that are in this Genesis Creation Early Man. As some of you might know, this book is a fantastic book on the topic, but one of the problems right now is that you can't get copies of it because they're sold out. And until some more are printed, or I don't know if they're actually going to do a reprint or if they're going to do a new edition, I sent an email out to actually see if there would be any new copies of this book coming out in the near future. And hopefully if I get a response, I can put that in the description or in the comment section. Okay, so one of the writers about Darwinian evolution in this book comes from St. Theophon the Recluse. It's written here, in order to help his fellow believers remain firm in the Orthodox faith within the context of modernity, he read widely in the fields of philosophy and science and stayed abreast of the latest intellectual currents. So uh, he compares the unbelief of the Sadducees in Christ's time with that of the evolutionist of his own time. And he writes, The Sadducees had a seemingly insoluble objection to the resurrection, but the Lord resolved it with a few words to them, and so clearly that everyone understood and acknowledged the Sadducees to have been beaten by the truth of his word. What the Sadducees were then unbelievers of all sorts are now. They have heaped up a multitude of fanciful suppositions for themselves, elevated them to the status of irrefutable truths, and plumbed themselves on them, assuming that nothing can be said against them. In fact, they are so ungrounded that it is not even worthwhile speaking against them. All of their sophistry is a house of cards, blow on it, and it flies apart. There is no need to refute it in its parts. It is enough to regard it as one regards dreams. When speaking against dreams, people do not prove the absurdity in their composition or in their individual parts, but only say, it's a dream. And with that, they resolve everything. It is the same with the theory of the formation of the world from a nebula and its supports, with the theory of a biogenesis and Darwin's origin of genera and species, and with his last dream about the descent of man. It is all like delirium. When you read them, you are walking in the midst of shadows. And scientists? Well, what can you do with them? Their motto is, if you don't like it, don't listen, but don't prevent me from lying. St. Theophan here um, comments on the descent of man from the animals. And he writes, what ought we to preach? The saint asks. We should cry to all sons of the kingdom. Don't run from the kingdom into bondage and slavery. For they are in fact running. Some are captivated by freedom of mind. They say, we don't want the bonds of faith and the oppression of authority, even divine authority. We'll figure out, we'll figure things out and make up our minds for ourselves. So they have made up their minds. They've built fables in which there is more childishness than in the mythology of the Greeks. And they magnify themselves. Others are enticed by the broad path of the passions. They say we don't want to know positive commandments or the demands of conscience. This is all abstract. We need tangible naturalness. And they have gone after it. What has come of it? They have bowed down before dumb beasts. Has not the theory that man originated from animals arisen from this moral fall? This is where they have gone. And everyone runs from the Lord. Everyone runs. So also, St. Theophan wrote that Darwinism together with the other godless philosophies from the West, is deserving of formal condemnation by the Orthodox Church. And he goes on to say, These days many nihilists of both sexes, naturalists, Darwinists, spiritists, and westernizers in general have multiplied among us. All right, you're thinking, would the Church have been silent? Would it not have proffered its voice? Would it not have condemned or anathematized them if there had been something new in their teaching? To be sure, a council would have done so without doubt, and all of them with their teachings would have been given over to anathema. To the current rite of orthodoxy, only the following item would have to be added to Buchner, Feuerbach, Darwin, Renan, Kardec, and all their followers anathema. But there is no need either for special counsel or for any kind of addition. All of their false teachings were anathematized long ago. At the present time, not only in principal cities, but in all places and churches, the rite of orthodoxy ought to be brought in and celebrated. 
so that all the teachings contrary to the word of God might be collected and that it might be proclaimed to everyone what they must fear and from what teaching they must flee and all might know. Many are seduced intellectually only through ignorance and therefore a public condemnation of pernicious teachings would save them from destruction. If the action of anathema is terrible to someone, then let him avoid the teachings that lead to it. Let him who is afraid of it for the sake of others bring them back to a healthy teaching. If you who are not favorably disposed to this action are orthodox, then you are going against yourself. And if you have already lost sound teaching, then what business do you have concerning what is done in the church that supports it? After all, you've already separated yourself from the church and have your own convictions, your own way of looking at things. Well, live with them, then. It's all the same whether or not your name and your teaching are uttered under the anathema. You are already under anathema if you philosophize against the church and persist in this philosophizing. So St. Theophon also goes on to predict that if natural Listic evolutionary notions of the world's origin continue to be propagated. The resulting loss of faith among the Russian people would help pave the way for the overthrow of the Orthodox Christian government of Russia. Less than uh, three decades later, that actually happened. He's quoted in writing, People have suddenly had a thought and have started to write about preserving faith, but they don't want to block the source of unbelief. This source is the spread of the teaching that the world formed by itself, according to which there is no need for God, and the soul does not exist. It's all atoms and chemistry, nothing more. This is being preached at rostrums and in literature. He who breathes these fumes is inescapably stupefied and loses his sense and faith. Until these books are destroyed, until professors and literary men are forced not only not to hold to this theory, but even to demolish it, until then, Faithlessness will grow and grow, and with it, self-will and destruction of the present government. That's the way the French Revolution went. St. Theophon also, at the same time, saw that the natural sciences were being falsely held up as the most reliable and authoritative source of all knowledge. In various places, he spoke of this increasingly pervasive problem. There is not a single science which could be established solidly on its own principles, Something can be obtained from all the sciences, but this is not something that gives one the right to cite science as a decisive authority. It is not science itself, but scientists who twist science however they want. Consequently, there are only the conjectures and inferences of scientists. In vain do people think highly about the world and its laws, about nature and its forces, as if there were something untouchable, indisputable, and inviolable in them. Under the appearance of science, they are devising for themselves an idol worship that is more destructive than the mythological idol worship of the ancient Greeks. No, brethren, it is not by the laws and forces of nature that the life of each one of us is upheld, but by the power of God acting within us, the Lord upholding all things by the word of his power, which is Hebrews uh, 1.3. There is each one of us by the same word of his power. Let us maintain this thought in our mind and imprint it in our heart. The all active power of God bears us over the abyss of nothingness, and we live and move and have our being, and that's Acts uh, 17.28. If he takes away his spirit, if he removes his hand, we will disappear and will no longer be remembered among the living. But if the Lord holds us, then he touches us. He does not merely see us mentally. No, he touches us as one hand touches another, or as the air touches one's body. How consoling and awesome. Okay, also, St. Theophon goes on to write what can happen to a person's outlook when he does not keep scientific knowledge in a position subordinate to his Christian faith. A pure spirit, and this uh, word there is for the noose, a pure spirit contemplates God and receives from him knowledge of mysteries. But even the spirit combined with the body after the diversity of the creation of the visible world has been revealed to it through the senses, having been enlightened by the same inward illumination from above, must contemplate in the creations all the mysteries of the knowledge of God and the mysteries of God's making and governing of the world, 
so that even when faced with this great amount of knowledge, it can remain unperturbed in the same single divine contemplation. But having fallen, a person is captivated by the diversity of created things and even overwhelmed by impression from them, which supplant within him the very thought of God. Studying created things, he goes no further than what he sees in them, the composition and interrelations, not receiving illumination from above, does not see in them the clear reflection of God and the divine mysteries. The world has become for him a tarnished mirror in which nothing can be seen but the mirror itself. Hence a great amount of knowledge suppresses within him the knowledge of the one thing. It turns him away from it, makes him cold toward it, such is the prize and such is the fruit of science in a fallen state. Saint Theophan also writes, a believer has the full right to insinuate himself with spiritual things into the material realm, while materialists crawl with their matter without a twinge of conscience into the spiritual realm. Right-mindedness is on our side, while incoherence is on theirs. And this is not because every sandpiper praises its own swamp, rather it is to the point. Matter cannot be either a power or a purpose. Both are outside of it. Matter can only be a means and a field for spiritual powers in accordance with the spiritual origin, the creator of all things. So these quotes are from Genesis, Creation, and Early Man, a book I highly recommend to get. It's a very thick book. It's over a thousand pages. Um, and uh, the actual reading, I think, you, it's if you don't include the index and all that sort of stuff, it's... Uh, over 900 pages, I think 900 and like 951 pages in total. I definitely recommend if you have it at a parish library to get it and read it, or if you can find, a, um, borrow a copy or find a copy for, uh, at a bookstore or something like that to pick yourself up this book. And like I said, if I find anything out from an email about when the possible publication might be, I will uh, let you guys all know in the comments. So until next time, this is James signing out.